Can the rest of the world stay out of it when Russia's invasion of Ukraine starts to threaten global food supplies? This week's bombing of the Black Sea resort of Odessa, a reminder that Moscow's blockading Ukraine's main port of export for wheat and other grains. The UN's World Food Program relies on those cereals, and already they're feeling the pinch in places like civil war-torn Ethiopia. We'll ask what it would take to reopen the Black Sea and about alternatives, like a land route through Poland suggested by the EU Agriculture Commissioner. Moscow has ideas of its own, warned the Ukrainians, who accused the Kremlin of first stealing their land, stockpiles, farm equipment, with in the long run the aim of playing the generous benefactor who feeds the planet. It's not just about Ukraine and the developing world. How do you ensure food security for all? What lessons have we learned from global warming, population pressure, supply chain disruptions during COVID, and now war in Europe's breadbasket. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the threat to global food supplies. Joining us from the Ukrainian port city of Odessa, Petr Obukov, member of the Odessa City Council. Thank you for being with us here on France 24. Uh, good evening. Sylvie Berman was ambassador to, French ambassador to Russia from 2017 to 2019. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Mathieu Brun, scientific director at FARM, the Foundation for World Agriculture and Rurality, also an associate professor at uh, the French Political Science Institute Sciences Po's Bordeaux campus. Welcome. Thank you. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24Debate. Yeah, is it collateral damage or a deliberate target? Grain depots like the one blown up last week in the central Dnipropetrovsk region, stoking accusation that Moscow's making no mistake. Now, destroying uh, grain silos is one thing. Stealing wheat is another. The Associated Press reports that a Russian ship believed to be carrying stolen Ukrainian grain has docked in the Syrian port of Latakia. Uh, the Matros Pozinich turned off its transponders nearly a week ago in the Mediterranean off Cyprus. Ukraine alleges Russia initially tried to ship uh, the 27,000 tons of grain aboard to Egypt, which refused to take on the cargo before uh, going on to Syria. Uh, we, P Petro Obuhov, what, what's your reaction to that story? Uh, I know that our Ministry of International Affairs uh, is contacting with any other countries who could be buyers of this uh, grain, and they are to uh, talking them that this grain is stolen and um, that there will be consequences if they buy it, uh, at least uh, in uh, uh, media or um, in, in their uh, view in international uh, scene. So I believe that uh, that would not be uh, a story for Russia to just sell uh, just in, in simple way this uh, Ukrainian grain. Right now, uh, we saw those images of uh, the uh, European uh, Council President, Charles Michel, at the start of the week in your city, uh, visiting the port area. Uh, what, what's the situation? Like, how, how strong is the blockade? And what's the story when it comes? Because you're the main port of exit for, for a, a, most agricultural products from Ukraine. Uh, our port isn't functioning uh, since February because the uh, all seaways are not uh, safe. Uh, some commercial vessels were, were hit by Russians. It was not Ukrainian vessels. It was one from Qatar, one from Japan. And uh, also uh, the sea uh, near Odessa uh, is now, uh, now has a lot of uh, sea mines. So it's not safe to... to uh, to, to go to this area, and even if we stop the war today, uh, we need at least half of a year to clean the sea and to, to activate the sport again. The bombing that took place Monday to uh, Tuesday while Charles Michel was still in town, uh, what, what was that about in your view? Oh, it's very difficult to understand. Russian Ministry of Defense, uh, it's funny that it's called defense, not attacking. Uh, the ministry said that they have attacked uh, storage of uh, NATO weapons. But in reality, they have attacked uh, one of city malls. And uh, it's interesting that there was uh, uh, French shops, uh, Leroy Merlin and Ashan. And uh, that uh, both uh, companies are still working in Russia. 
So um, I, I think that uh, that was two points. They are trying to uh, attack what do they think is our military uh, targets and to somehow stop uh, our resistance. And uh, they fail in that uh, point. And the second, they are attacking cities where um, international leaders uh, in, in that moment of time uh, are present. It was Charles Michel in Odessa and was Antonio Guterres in Kiev. Sylvie Berman, is that how you read the events of the past week, the, 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 the long-range missile attacks that we've seen? Well, in Odessa, it's very difficult to say, and as it has been said, it's very difficult to, to understand as well. But it's true that there is a blockade of all uh, Ukrainian ports, and uh, it concerns uh, uh, grains, uh, wheat, corn, etc., etc. Uh, but there's also, um, well, some uh, uh, decisions from the Russian uh, ministry also not to uh, sell too much, not to supply uh, the, uh, wheat uh, from Russia also because they are the first exporter and they are also the first exporter for fertilizers. And so it has consequences in the, <coughs> in the world and in particular in Africa. And they know that and the, the price are rising. So they two uh, kind of blockades, the blockade of, uh, Russia, of uh, Ukrainian ports and also decision to uh, make a kind of embargo also from Russia. At the beginning of the war, we obviously focused immediately on oil and gas uh, here in Europe and in large parts of the world. You, as a former ambassador to Moscow, did you, were you already thinking, well, it's, this is also about food? Uh, yes, oil of, and gas concern the Europeans and not so much the Africans, for instance, or what is called the rest of the world. And, uh, and it's different for food supplies because it's, it doesn't really concern the Europeans and in particular not really France, but other countries. And it can provoke some uh, riots like it used to uh, be the case in, uh, in Tunisia and in Egypt. And what is interesting, and that's the reason why it's a geopolitical arm, is that those countries abstain or didn't participate in a vote in the uh, UN uh, for that reason, because they are receiving some uh, uh, wheat supplies from, uh, from Russia. So it's very geopolitical. And by the way, uh, Emmanuel Macron mentioned that uh, once when he talked to, uh, to Putin, the risk of uh, uh, world uh, hunger. And it's something he also brought up, and we'll talk about it perhaps a bit later on, uh, uh, with uh, the Indian Prime Minister when he was in town uh, last week. Uh, we've talked about global supply chains when it comes to Russian oil and precious metals, when it comes to wheat, barley, corn, rapeseeds, sunflower seeds. Uh, it's also the case enough, well, to trigger panic buying of sunflower oil in some parts. Uh, it's not just food, but also essentials for growing crops that have farmers in faraway Zimbabwe seeking alternatives. We are doing our own fertilizer now. We, have, we are mixing seven bags of uh, cow dung or uh, the cattle manure or the chicken waste with 120 mils of zinc to make compounds. But the difficult part of this is, is just compound. We need to do AN. It's very difficult to do AN. But we are producing AN at a very low uh, quantity. And uh, ammonium nitrate, which is an essential ingredient when you're, when you're making fertilizer. Mathieu Brun, we're, we're all becoming experts in hydrocarbons, but also uh, we, don't, we realize how little we know about the food we eat and where it comes from. And a whole lot of it comes from Ukraine and Russia. Uh, exactly, the Black Sea now, the Black Sea region, so Ukraine, Russia, but also Romania and the other countries around are producing a lot of the food we are eating all over the world and not just in Europe, but also in, in Africa, in, in Asia. Uh, and what, what's happening now in, uh, in Ukraine and Russia, and Russia 
shows actually how uh, food is a weapon, a geopolitical weapon, and how the system, the food systems, have been actually uh, are now very codependent. Uh, uh, almost a quarter of the the, the grain are sell, sold from Russia and Ukraine. Eighty percent of sunflower oil is coming from Russia and Ukraine. So there is um, a huge issue of dependence and it raises also uh, issues of food sovereignty. And can you just increase production elsewhere? And uh, yeah, there'll be a little hiccup for a few months, but then afterwards the world will adjust? It's not that easy because when you think about 100,000 um, uh, tons here, 100,000 tons here, uh, and, and another 100,000 uh, anywhere else, it, it, it's, it's a lot. And, and we have been actually specializing our food systems, our agricultural systems for decades, almost centuries. Now it's, 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 it's now that uh, there are regions that are specializing on, on wheat, that are, uh, some others are specializing on soybean. So there is a, a lot of concentration and you cannot just over the year change that. You need research, you need seeds, you need fertilizers, inputs and also logistics. And when you see the, the, the closing of the ports, it's a lot about logistics uh, when it comes to food security. A lot about logistics. Let's talk about logistics. On Thursday, the European Commission is due to unveil a plan for what it calls solidarity lanes. It would bypass the Russian blockade by instead favoring land and rail to transport food out of Ukraine to Poland's Baltic seaports. Uh, Petro Obukov, would that work? Uh, that will work, but it uh, would be very slowly. I heard that um, they would need five years to transfer all uh, grains and seeds that we have already in Ukraine, which we normally sold by sea in one year. So it would take a long time. It couldn't happen overnight. Right now, uh, what's the story? Are silos full? or Because we're getting close to the period where there's going to be the, the spring harvest now. Uh, they are almost full. We we trying to transfer what we can, but it, it, we can do it slowly. And I think uh, for um, uh, simplification of procedures of export. And what's the state when it comes to uh, rail and roads? We're seeing that uh, they've been targeted by uh, Russian strikes. Um, you should understand that Russian strikes are not so precise that they advertise. Uh, they try to attack our military objects, and uh, most of times they miss. Um, they miss even for one time they have missed two kilometers. And even if they strike railway uh, infrastructure, it could be easily rebuilt in hours, not even days. So um, that is not a problem. And when it comes to the Black Sea, uh, is it basically now Russia's property? Um, uh, Ukrainian part, yes, but uh, we have also Romania. Romanian port Constanza is working, and we trying to export some things uh, by this port. Uh, also, Turkey, Georgia, and all other countries, Bulgaria, uh, still can use uh, Black Sea. Is that a better alternative than Poland? Um, it's not a good uh, alternative, but uh, that's all that that we have. All that we have uh, for now, you say. Um, f I want to bring in at this point in time uh, uh, Sunny Kapoor uh, from Oslo, professor of climate, ge uh, geoeconomics, and finance at the European uh, University uh, Institute. Thanks for being with us here in the France 24 debate, Sunny. Earlier, we heard uh, Ambassador Berman uh, talking about how uh, countries outside of Europe. Uh, for basically self-interest are having to hedge their bets because they're dependent on uh, uh, Russian food imports. With Odessa blockaded, is that going to change? Uh, no, uh, I, I suspect not. And this goes back to the last time that there was global food insecurity of this magnitude. Uh, which ended up in very dysfunctional actions by a number of governments, uh, and the worst of which was export controls by a number of the prominent uh, food exporters. Now, that is globally suboptimal. Everybody ends up worse off. And this time round, uh, even in these early days of you know, food price spikes, 
Uh, we've already seen a number of governments, such as that of Indonesia, announce unilateral actions blocking food exports, uh, and many other potentially to follow. Uh, now, this is not going to be good for anybody because globally, uh, despite the serious logistical challenges uh, we've been discussing, uh, from a calorific uh, viewpoint, there is more than enough food. It is just in the wrong places. And if export bans are put in place, uh, the burden is going to fall on the poorest. And last time, it had geopolitical consequences. 22 countries saw food and famine-related riots in the last episode. And this The last time, episode being that period around 2008? Exactly. When we saw the, the rise of the, the Arab Spring, the riots in Egypt, for example. And this time around, we've already seen both in Pakistan and in Sri Lanka, food price spikes have partly contributed to the uh, political instability. And this is going to spread far more widely. And would that have happened anyway without Russia invading Ukraine? Because we saw the uh, world economy overheat a little bit, perhaps, at least energy prices did, uh, coming out of the COVID pandemic. Well, there's these four interlinked uh, Fs, uh, the food and feed stock, uh, for fee animal feed, fertilizer, fuel, and financing. And all of these feed on each other. And already, uh, you, as you rightly said, before Russia attacked Ukraine, we had a spike in the cost of fertilizer because we had a cost in the spike of fuels, particularly diesel. We had a spike in the cost of financing as financing from poor developing countries dried up. And of course, we had a direct spike in the cost of food as well as animal feedstock. But the Russian invasion has put everything on steroids, turbochargers. It's hard to say whether it's made the crisis twice as bad as it would have been or three times as bad. But I think that is somewhere in the right magnitude. So it has really, really made what was already a bad situation significantly worse, put, put a fire on, on dry tinder, so as to speak. Is there any kind, Sylvie Berman, of a economic logic in what's being decided at the Kremlin? Or is this just an ideological battle, this decision to invade Ukraine? When you hear Sonny Kapoor describe all the surrounding factors and what's going on in our globalized world. No, no, I don't think there was any economic reasons in the uh, invasion of It's Ukraine. not always about the economy. No, 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 absolutely not. And even on the contrary, because it's very detrimental to Russian economy. And uh, Putin knew that before and he didn't care. On the contrary, he prepared his country uh, for more sanctions. And so, uh, and even so, if the cost of living of the population is decreasing, that's not his problem. It's purely ideological. But of course, economy is a weapon now, and so he can uh, use it uh, uh, that way. But I, I, I think, yes, the, the question was about Russia. But we have to discuss also what the EU can do because, uh, well, EU is also a producer and an exporter, and uh, uh, I think there's something uh, that can be, be done just to uh, help with this uh, very difficult And how do you situation. help? How do you help? By, by, with the suggestion by that we talked about where on Thursday, this proposal that's going to be unveiled to get the Ukrainian food exports out, or by... Uh, upping production in other EU nations for the rest of the world? Yeah, I, I, I think, yes, <laughs> the, the, the two options, of course. The first one, as it has been explained, is a question of quantity and of time. So it's very slow. Uh, so uh, probably, but uh, <laughs> you are more specialist than, uh, than me, uh, we could uh, have uh, more uh, production and more exports, but also uh, there was a uh, uh, reform uh, uh, decided not only by the Commission, by the Member States, which is the system which is uh, called farm to fork. And uh, the problem is that, on the contrary, this is less production. 
uh, because it's part of the Green Deal. So maybe there could be a suspension of this uh, uh, policy. Uh, this is where it hurts, doesn't it, Mathieu Brun? Because on the one hand, there's how do you help Ukraine? And, and then on the other hand, how do you save the planet? Or are the two yeah, you, in the you, EU's you case? Is yeah, it a problem you, like, um, com compromising the two? Or You have meshing? somehow to jump in with, with two legs, geopolitics and environment. And it's a very interesting point in the debate when it comes to how we should discuss or not the policies that were um, uh, discussed and, and voted in the, in, in, in the European Union. Um, but I, I would like to stress on, on the fact that the main issue here is not uh, raising production in Europe, but uh, taking some actions in terms of price volatility. Because the first and, and foremost, most important thing when it comes to food security is the price that the people are paying. There is enough food uh, produced uh, all over the world. The issue is, uh, like the, the colleague said, uh, when, where it is produced and how we can tra uh, transport the, the, the transportation and logistics. But especially in the case of Africa, they are not that much relying on, on wheat exports from Russia and Ukraine. I'm not taking the case of Egypt, which is or Morocco or Tunisia or Lebanon. They are really highly dependent on, on, on the wheat. But when it comes to sub-Saharan Africa, it's mainly to feed the cities. Uh, but the issue is that how the price of wheat uh, all over the planet is impacting the, the price that people are buying the foods uh, in, uh, in Bamako or in Ethiopia or in Kenya or anywhere in, 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 in southern uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's the main issue, price, volatility and the access of foods. I'm, I'm not sure the issue is to uh, raise production in, in Europe. So to answer Sylvie's question, what can the EU do? Well, the EU do, and the, the EU can do, and President Macron has already launched an initiative called the Food and Agricultural Resilience Mission. Uh, it, it is building on the few responses that were already on the table, like ten years ago, or, or in, 20, in 2008 and 2011. Um, and the issue is now to have short-term answers, making sure that the food needed in Yemen, in Somalia, or in Ethiopia, or anywhere, the food is needed that can access that they can access to foods and making sure that there is not uh, a blockade all over the world. But there's also long term uh, uh, issues, which is how we manage to uh, have our own foods uh, diets uh, being into tra transition and transition from uh, from from the diet we have to a, a more sustainable uh, diet. Eating less meat. It, yeah, basically, it less meat. Uh, but also in terms of long-term investment, and this is something we are developing at uh, the foundation where I, I work for, is how we invest on agriculture. For the last 20 years, we haven't invested enough, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa or in Asia. And now the issue is, is to see that the European Union is really financing agriculture. Uh, four times uh, more than what is. You, you know that what you're saying is in contradiction with what the EU Farm Commissioner tweeted earlier in the day, saying that uh, EU policy is not about trying to reduce meat production. Uh, well, we have tackled the question, the issue. We, we can't just uh, continue eating uh, that much. I'm, I'm, I just, I don't want to focus too much. Yeah, on, but we're getting into a side meat. issue here. But, but, but it is important in the sense that we're talking about yeah. how to do both, support Ukraine and, half, and, and half, not yeah. de get derailed from uh, climate goals, uh, uh, as Ambassador Berman was, was mentioning. Um, uh, last week, by the way, when India's Prime Minister paid a call on French President Emmanuel Macron, much of the conversation focused on food security for the developing world. India exported, by the way, record amounts of wheat in the month of April, picking up some of the slack from the shortfall in Europe. Because of the war between Russia and Ukraine, many countries don't have wheat anymore. But India is going to export some to meet their needs. Look, we have so much. It's everywhere. So to make up the shortfall, Sunny Kapoor, uh, the developing world doesn't necessarily need Ukraine, Russia, Europe. So what does it need the EU for right now? Well, the biggest uh, thing the EU will need to do, can do, must do, is provide financing. As in the case of previous famines, the reason for the famine is often not the, the lack of availability of calories and grains. It is the lack of affordability. And particularly at a time that developing countries were suffering already from excessive debt burdens, about 50 are in debt distress. Uh, COVID-related economic hangover, 
and the withdrawal of uh, large amounts of liquidity from the global financial system as the Fed starts to tighten, financing conditions have not been worse in living memory. And the prices of essential commodities, not just food, but fuel, energy, is it has not been uh, more dramatically difficult. So the biggest, most important thing the EU and the rich world needs to do is to step forward with a very generous financing package that funds the World Food Program, that funds UN agencies, that funds countries and governments and the poorest, even within these countries themselves, to be able to purchase food rather than trying to intervene marginally at, you know, marginally increasing production in the EU uh, by a bit here and a bit there. And the second important thing that we all can do is to do what we need to do in parallel on the energy front, which is to make a public call to citizens across the world, especially in the EU and in the US, to stop food waste, to be more mindful because there's an ongoing global shortage. In the same way, we've been asking everybody to lower down thermostats and temperatures, and that can have a dramatically uh, Im a large impact on the reduction of food waste and increase the amount of food available for consumption in the developing world. Those are the two near-term policies that can have an immediate impact in helping the developing world navigate this food crisis. And what about uh, when Peter Obukov mentions uh, the uh, those grain silos that are could fill up fast and overflow? What? How do you help Ukraine, Sonny Kapoor? Well, uh, he on the ground knows far more than I do. The numbers I have heard are similar, that the logistical nightmare of taking a well or a large-scale supply chain through the Black Sea export route into either landfill routes or diverting that into other Black Sea ports is, is very, very tricky. It must be done. It can be done. We don't know how long the Russian blockade will last, but the world cannot, world's hungry cannot depend on that. So these are actions that need to be taken in parallel. And when you see India uh, upping its production, is that a good news for everyone? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. When you see India upping its uh, farm exports, good news for well, the, the big challenge there, and I've heard you speak about the environment, is the is the sort of perfect storm of the effects of climate change starting to hit in an accelerated way. Uh, exactly as we face this global food shortage, uh, 30 out of 50 American states have a drought. To Big wheat producing Canadian provinces are very dry. France is facing very dry conditions, one of the biggest, the EU's biggest wheat exporter. India has seen a heat wave, so far so good, but who knows how production might go. So it's quite likely we need to build in an additional safety margin that a reasonable amount of cereal uh, grain production might be hit by large scale negative climate impacts this year. Uh, so, yes, uh, India needs to, India must open its, uh, its silos, and if it has excess wheat, uh, you know, definitely export it into the global markets, as does China. China's food uh, stockpiles are a national secret, but there's an assumption it has substantial amounts. And if it comes to global food security, China should absolutely start unloading some of the strategic food stockpiles into the global markets to save the world's hungry and poor. Peter Obukov, uh, the considerations of uh, uh, what China, what India does, uh, does it seem, obviously it must seem far away from, from, from where you are right now when you have air raid sirens uh, going off. What do Ukrainians want at this point in time on this front? I believe that uh, all this crisis could be stopped by stopping the war. And we can stop the war only by two means. First of all, we need as much weapons as possible. Uh, that should be contemporary weapons to distant attacking Russian uh, troops on Ukrainian soil. 
it could not be um, fixed by diplomacy. We understand that we can only win uh, on the land uh, fighting with Russia. So investing in weapons to Ukraine, you are investing to your uh, uh, so solution of food crisis. And the second is sanctions. Uh, there are still no uh, oil embargo on Russia. You are still paying money to Russia even now. Uh, I understand that it is difficult uh, to do uh, technically. You, you should find some another um, sources of oil and gas. But uh, when you stop uh, money supply of Russia and when you uh, start uh, and uh, expand supply of weapons to Ukraine, that would uh, would uh, uh, bring uh, the solution uh, uh, for us. Sylvie Berman, when you, you saw the European Commission president earlier this week go cap in hand to Hungary to try to convince Viktor Orban, uh, offer some incentives, some sweeteners uh, for an EU-wide embargo on uh, Russian oil, um, it, it brings us back to what Sonny Kapoor said about how we all have to turn the thermostat down a little bit. Yeah, but I think... Uh well, Hungary, of course, has a very uh, special uh, position. No, it's not only economic, but uh, we can understand that uh, it would raise some economic uh, difficulties. For oil, <clears throat> maybe we, we could have a result. It's much more difficult for gas, in, in particular for, the, for Germany, because it would uh, ruin uh, the economy. And so it's a very difficult decision to take for our government, because in the future there can be some uh, uh, also social uh, unrest. But, well, they, uh, well this mayor said that there is two solutions. One is providing weapons. That's what is done by uh, the Western world, uh, more from the Americans, of course, but also from Europe. It's the first time that we decided to provide two uh, billion uh, armaments to, uh, to a country. And uh, um, the, the question of sanctions is a little bit different because it takes time to have uh, uh, a result or a consequence. And for the time being, I don't think that uh, Vladimir Putin will stop the war because of these sanctions. Of course, the sanctions will weaken uh, a Russian economy. But in the future, for the time being, he will continue his war because it was uh, ideologically uh, motivated. And the war, again, is not the only thing on people's uh, minds. Uh, meteorologists, and we, we heard Sonny Kapoor mentioning it, meteorologists warning that France's breadbasket in the northern half of the country will need significant rain within 10 to 15 days or else this year's harvest will be impacted in the Loiret region south of Paris. It's the third time in five years that farmers have had to face the prospect of severe drought. Vadika Bael has more. This cereal farmer in the Loire region is keeping a close eye on his crops. The heat wave and the drought are worrying him. If there is drought, the crop will shrink, and then all these ears of wheat won't grow. The wheat intended for pasta production that's been watered is growing correctly for the moment. But for how long can they go without regular irrigation? We must water whatever we can. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to irrigate everything since we have irrigation quotas here. And we already have 60% of our quota used this year. He'll have to make some painful choices to save these crop cultures, like stopping irrigation of this rapeseed crop, a 35% loss of his raw wheat production. We're going to continue watering the wheat because the impact of the drought on the wheat could cut the harvest in half. This farmer also has difficult decisions to make. He can no longer water his already dry wheat crop because the sandy earth doesn't retain moisture well. If we took a look here, it's very sandy. Yes, look, it's so dry, dry like dust. Here in my end, this is like clay. It retains the water a lot better, so it's a reserve. Near his fields, the river's water levels decrease a little more each day, an abnormally low level for the season. And the lack of rain in the coming days could complicate the situation. Talking Mathieu Brun about um, changing the crops now in France, planting things like sorghum instead of wheat. 
Yeah, and that's that's really how I I can say that the the issue is to foresight to see what's going to happen in the coming months because the farmers are trying to cope with scarcity. Because because you heard uh, Sylvie Berman say how sanctions take time. Uh, Climate change also takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. It happens, but this is now the third time in five years, and it's one of these things that's setting in over a long period. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, it's also uh, planting and growing food takes time. Uh, it takes energy, uh, water, and we need actually to to make sure that we support the farmers to cope with um, climate change. Uh, the adaptation, but also uh, increase or decrease uh, the, the the emissions. The, 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 um, uh, because if if we cannot cope with that issue, there there will be uh, problems, and it's not just France. We can see a drought in Morocco or in in India or in Pakistan, and I'm really worried about South how America. and South America, and I'm worried about how the the campaign next year or in in the fall of of 2022nd. Uh, because if there is not enough food, then there will be some uh, very uh, crucial political issues. Mathieu Brun, I know you have to leave us early, but I want to thank you for joining us thank here in, in the France 24 debate. Sonny Kapoor, um, uh, when the history books uh, are written about why Russia invaded Ukraine, because we're still asking the question, um, uh, will it be like you were mentioning 2008 being a trigger for the Arab Spring? Uh, will it be because of COVID? Will it be because of climate change? Or will it just be solely and purely uh, about uh, the dynamic of post-Soviet politics? Uh, I think it, it would go down to two factors. One is the idiosyncrasy and I, what at this point it's only appropriate to say madness of Vladimir Putin, single man launching his country into an unprecedented war, guaranteeing poverty and economic destruction. But what in addition to the uh, complication of post-Soviet politics, which has never really settled down, uh, the other way of also looking at this, this is the last hurrah of a fading commodity oil superpower uh, that knows that the future is bleak. Uh, Russia's demographic decline is steep. It has failed to properly industrialize its economy. It's, it's effectively a commodity economy stuck in what looks like the first world, but has very little sophisticated industry. And so this is the last hurrah for a power that sees that the year 2030, 2040 will mean it will be far more diminished. And this is the last time it can capitalize on it being one of the major exporters of fossil fuels, which still matter in the world. By the year 2030, 2040, 2050, it will be irrelevant, uh, many of these commodity exports, and it will not be a superpower of any kind whatsoever. Till and until there's a post-Putin post -Putin golden age and Russia ends uh, ends up with you know, civilized societies like the rest of us. Sylvie Verman, when you were imposed from 2017, 2000, did you sense Russia was in decline? Uh, well, uh, not really. I think it's very difficult to say because at the same time, they had a lot of reserves in the central bank and uh, they had uh, this, uh, well, oil and gas industry and also agro-food industry because of our sanctions, of course. And uh, The 2014 sanctions. Absol absolutely. But they haven't made the necessary reforms. And uh, so uh, it, it was still a, a weak economy. Uh, at the same time, there was also... Uh, they, there's the question of demography, of course, because they are losing people. And there is brain drain because a lot of young and talented people left the country. And it is even worse now because all those who are opposing the, the war are leaving the country and they are the, the best and the, and the brightest. So this is a problem. And of course, uh, the, uh, well, the question of sanctions will accelerate uh, the, uh, uh, the change of uh, economy, the use of uh, fossil uh, industry. And so it will have a consequence on Russia, of course, and sooner than expected because they knew that they were uh, working also on hydrogen and the new uh, uh, and uh, renewable, but uh, they still counted on those uh, uh, 
uh, uh, oil and gas uh, uh, resources. And now they, they will have to, well, accelerate the transition, except that China, of course, will buy more oil and gas from, uh, from Russia. But, well, nevertheless, it, uh, they will have to uh, find some, uh, something else. And uh, for the time being, it's difficult because it needs uh, some restructuring, some, uh, uh, some reforms, and you can't do that when uh, you're at war. Uh, Peter Obukov, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Russia's population is declining. Yeah, they didn't make uh, perhaps the necessary reforms to cope with an accelerating globalization. Uh, nonetheless, even if they miss the target on those bombing raids, is time on Russia's side in this conflict? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think the time is on our side because Russia representing uh, maybe 2.5, 2.7 percent of world GDP, and uh, Ukraine, with help of Western countries, are representing well, maybe 50 percent of world GDP. Yeah, I don't believe that uh, they could they could uh, take uh, take on us. It's impossible. We have contemporary uh, weapons already. We have um, the best. Uh, weapons in the world now, and uh, we will have more. And we have uh, uh, 5,000 uh, hundreds of motivated troops of, in Ukraine, and we have unmotivated uh, troops in Russia uh, army. They don't understand for what they are fighting now, because the goals of this um, war it, is not clear. It, it could not be. Um, it couldn't be uh, uh, rated. So. Um, they they will defeat and they will defeat uh, sooner than we think. And uh, I've heard that Russian economy began to struggle since 2011. Uh, if we uh, subtract uh, the commodity part of this economy, it's declining. And uh, there are no reforms. They are just depending on this. That's absolutely crazy for them to start this war being so dependent from, from the Western world. And in that period, from 2014 to today, uh, when those first sanctions hit, how has Odessa changed? Um, uh, you see, before the uh, occupation of the Crimea, uh, there was two uh, points in, in Ukraine where people from Ukraine and from Russia and from Belarus came to Ukraine on summer season to the sea. It was Crimea and Odessa. But after um, the occupation of Crimea, uh, most of Ukrainians uh, came to Odessa uh, in summers. So Odessa uh, became the, the, one, uh, the only one uh, uh, resort in Ukraine. Um, Odessa had developed uh, through these years. We have made a lot of reforms in Ukraine. And um, we have moved to the future. We have electronic system of uh, uh, government uh, um, supplies where everybody could see the standards auctions. Uh, we have um, any of our um, uh, member of parliament of municipal government, any people, any man who are working for government should place his declaration, financial declaration publicly. So I could see any person who is working for government, what do he have? And if he has, if he drives, for example, car which he cannot afford through his declaration, he will be punished. And uh, all of them know this. We have um, uh, free media, we have free elections. So we are, uh, Putin is right that we are anti-Russia. We, we are anti-pod country. We are country built on freedom on European values. And his country is not. And he will fail. Uh, and this will also lead to economic losses, even without war, uh, being not free, making you um, poor. Sunny Kapoor, uh, you uh, talked earlier about the, the, the decision uh, of Vladimir Putin and the decision that could or won't be made or will be made by the rest of the world. How much pain do you feel the rest of the world is willing to take in this battle? Well, I think uh, the rest of the world is doesn't really have a choice because the signal uh, from stepping back from sanctions and letting Russia more raid over Ukraine uh, 
uh, would send to other rogue powers uh, the signal it would send to states that are at the cusp of or already have access to nuclear weapons or at the cusp of acquiring them, that just because you have a nuclear weapon and you threaten to be crazy, you can get away with anything, will be will usher in a, a world order of, of massive insecurity, much larger conflict, uh, potentially far greater, you know, dictatorial reach and a rollback of liberal democracy. So I think the stakes here are so high that the world cannot afford to let Vladimir Putin win. At worst, he needs to be contained. At best, he needs to be defeated. And whatever pain, economic, uh, you know, politically dislocating that we need to take, we need to take it on the chin. We can be smarter with our sanctions. We can be more coordinated with our actions. But there is no way back. We'll have to leave it there. Unfortunately, we're running short on time. I want to thank you so much, Sunny Kapoor, for joining us uh, from Oslo. Uh, Peter Obokov from the uh, uh, Ukrainian port city of Odessa. Uh, Sylvie Berman, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.